Hello, everybody, and welcome to the supplementary addendum appendix sources video that goes with the syllabus. There we go. I don't know why I wasn't moving there for a second. Sorry. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are no required textbooks in this course. If I do understand the benefit of a textbook and why some people really like them, you know, it's a lot of codified, organized, dense information right there in an easy to, to access format. And in the syllabus video, I did mention a couple of textbooks that I thought were good textbooks. Again, they're not required. You're not going to lose anything by not having them in this course, but if you would like one, I do have some recommendations. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you haven't watched the syllabus video and you should have done that. Shame. So uh, in this class, we're gonna focus on professional sources. Uh, you can use any professional source you want in your assignment. And in all honesty, you could use a textbook. There's nothing wrong with them. I don't have them um, noted here. But within a professional context, I would not feel comfortable citing a textbook for something. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I would look for something else and make sure that you're, you're current. So you can use any one you want. These are the ones that I recommend. Okay. So what professional sources do I recommend? Uh, research journal articles are the best ones. Position and uh, or practice papers from professional organizations. These are sometimes referred to as white papers. Government sources and credible websites. So the grand uh, tradition of academia, we're going to break down this broken down list into further broken down points. So uh, journal articles are generated from research typically Sometimes there are analyses or meta-analyses of the literature, but they are based on practice or research in some way. You can use PubMed or Google Scholar, and there are other ones, there's Biostatistica, I think. Any research library that gives you access to credible jur research journals is, is fine. You know, the, I don't care where they come from as long as they're credible sources. Um, the pro of research articles is that they tend to be, or journal articles, excuse me, they tend to be the most current info. You know, this is um, based on research that is being conducted right now. So this is the most recent information that we tend, that we tend to have. Um, they also are peer reviewed. So not only do people have to have good research that is current, and they also have to run it past some other people to review, and those people can say, you know, this this does not make sense. These use of statistics are incorrect. Um, we don't, I disagree with the writing in this point or the conclusion drawn. Now, you can't actually, peer review doesn't mean that you, this article has been validated, the research is great, and um, everybody backs what it says and we all endorse it. But it does mean that it has at least been checked for large errors in uh, in, in conclusions drawn. Okay. Uh, the cons of this are that it can be contradictory. Because it's research, because it's on the current edge, I, we're all drawing hypotheses from research being done. We may uh, Not everyone may agree on what the data shows. So sometimes it can be, we find different issues or different conclusions drawn from the research available. And it may require some extrapolation, especially in a pro uh, project, no, a uh, topic as broad as uh, gerontology. You may not find something specifically related to what you want. Uh, you may have to find, you know, you may have an article that's like, well, what are the effects of a plant-based diet on middle-aged Korean women? And that may not seem immediately relevant, but you can at least extrapolate from that that this is likely to also affect general you know, gerontological people in the same way. Make sense? You know, it's much easier to do that extrapolation than it is to say, well, so these are the mice studies we have at the time. But I think that may be all you've got because, again, this is current. It's always changing. Uh, also, side note. I know there's often a rule about trying to get the most recent research possible, but especially in nutrition research, it kind of goes through phases. So you may be limited on what you can find. If you try to limit yourself to say five years out, uh, you, you may have you may have to broaden that 
time range a little bit. Obviously, don't pull something from 1950, but you know, if you're having to go back to, to the early 2000s or something, that may be required in a journal article setting. All right, uh, white papers. Uh, these are the practice and, uh, and or position papers of professional organizations. Uh, for example, like AND, the AMA, the ADA, either one, dental or diabetes, the NPIAP, which is the pressure ulcer, I'm sorry, pressure injury now, advisory panel, etc., etc. The pros of this are they are clear and concise best practice recommendations. If you have some, uh, you have a patient with diabetes that you want to address the latest recommendations on, you can find that. Uh, it's also written and reviewed by experts. So as opposed to the research articles where what was being checked was, you know, do, does the math make sense? Is the writing relevant? Uh, this is actually reviewed by experts in the field. And if something is wrong, they will adjust that. They will call that out and correct it. And the a, a professional organization won't produce something that it's that the experts don't agree with. Um, the cons are that it tends to be very narrowly focused. Going back to the previous example, if we have somebody, if we're looking for a patient for information for a patient with diabetes, uh, the ADA is will give you a lot of information on that. They don't really have as much focus or interest in somebody with heart conditions, say, except as how they relate to diabetes. So you may need to go for a little bit more, may look to have to look for more sources for that person. Uh, they also tend to be rather dense and hard to use for non-experts. This is a little bit different now. Uh, now, if you go to a lot of these websites um, of these different professional organizations, you'll have a for healthcare practitioners section and a uh, for patients section. So you can go in there and say, I am a healthcare practitioner looking up information I'll take you to this page. I am a patient who's trying, wanting to understand the condition I have. I'll take you over here. So that's less of an issue than it used to be. Government sources. Uh, this is obviously this is research conducted and reported by the government. Uh, the pros of this are that the government sources are non-biased. Um, I, I realize that's a little bit of a spicy hot take in this day and age, but generally speaking, the government does not care what the results are. They want to know what the results are. And if you'll compare something like a research, uh, a research study conducted by, say, the National Institute on Aging versus the tobacco industry, the Institute on Aging doesn't really, it doesn't have a horse in the race as to what the results are. Whereas the tobacco industry very much does. So that, that's what I mean by non-biased. They have access to very large cohorts. Yeah, there are 330 million Americans. And at least demographic data is available on virtually everybody, if not more so. So within that group, you can definitely find a subset that matches the cohort you're interested in. And within that, some people who are willing to actively participate in the research. They uh, are able to do the largest scale studies of any of these groups because they have the best funding. Uh, if you've done research in the past, you know that funding is always an issue and always will be an issue. But the government doesn't have that problem to the same degree. We, we have effectively all helped pay for this. Uh, also, government studies don't have to be trendy. You know, nobody's expecting the um, National Institutes of Health to come out with something super sexy. You don't have to sell your research to somebody. The government has already commissioned this report. Uh, it also will, the government will also, blah. The government is also able to do research on in areas that nobody else really cares about at the time. You know, it's been pointed out that if you had a study checking on a way to stop, say, malaria versus a cure for baldness, cure for baldness, hands down, will get way more funding. But the government is likely more interested in stopping malaria. So it's able to do broader studies and maybe able to have a better impact. Now, the con of a government source is that it tends to be kind of slow. Um, if you ever read any of the research that, like a research project the government has produced something on. Um, now, let me back up, say, 
when it really needs to be, uh, it can be pretty quick. Uh, since we've just been through COVID recently, you know, say that was pretty quick. That was that was some fast research. Everybody came together and did they cranked out some stuff very very quickly. But on average, the government tends to be the slowest. Part of that's because it's very very meticulous. And part of that is because there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through doing government work. Um, lots of committees you have to uh, answer to a lot of different uh, bureaucracies and bodies you have to answer to. So it tends to slow things up a bit. All right, credible websites. Uh, credible websites in this case, I mean things like Medline, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, uh, public universities especially if you start looking around at public universities, a lot of them, or many of them at least, have a focus. Later on, you'll see a, a lab panel suggestion from the University of Missouri, which has done a lot of research into gerontology. You'll find that the universities often have a, a topic in, in, in uh, health and human services aspects that they, that they focus on. Um, the pros and cons of credible websites are that they're easy to update and they're easy to access. These are both. This is both a pro and a con because because it's so easy to access, everybody can get hold of it, uh, which is great for say you as a practitioner. Not necessarily great for somebody who's just learned that they have a condition, haven't learned how to filter good from bad information on this topic yet because it's brand new to them. They may pick up a whole bunch of stuff. They also may not have the ability to dis distinguish yet between what is a good and a bad website. Uh, also, they're easy to update. So, again, going back to that potential junk website, it's, it's, you can change it quickly. Uh, that's great as research comes in for a good website because it can keep itself current. That's not great on the terms of something that is less inherently invested in the truth, shall we say. Because they can also update things very quickly. So, what does this all wrap up to? In this class, I will ask you on assignments for sources and citations for the conclusions you draw for a um, for a patient for your interventions for your patients. Uh, part of this assignment is to find uh, your own sources. Now, also, and I've noticed, noted this in other places. You can't use lecture notes as sources, okay? Clearly, I agree with me, or I wouldn't have put that in there. You can't use the lecture notes. Uh, I learned after a while I needed to do that because y'all are crafty. So what are acceptable sources? Uh, journals and white papers or the, per, the uh, practice and position papers, government sources, and websites. And if you have questions, ask. By all means, uh, I'm, I'm not just putting this out here and saying, good luck, bye. If you have a question, please ask. I'm here to help. I'm going to do what I can. All right. All right, guys, that will take care of sources. Again, if you have questions, please do ask. I will catch you on the next one. You have a good day. Bye.